by sword, by fire, by conquest, the shadow of Rome spreads across Europe. Six centuries of total power, brutality, and games. Balanced, however, by refinement and extreme sensuality. The philosopher Juvenal reduced the empire to a single scornful formula, bread and games. Rome, however, built the first European civilization, and this included eating habits. We forget that the Romans offered food to their gods and their dead. They left us their hobs, fast food, and deep respect for great gourmets. By 30 AD, shops selling food were to be found at every street corner of Rome, already the center of a vast empire. In the cool of shaded patios, buyers, often extremely fine connoisseurs, were delighted by the subtle smells of vegetables, spices, and meats. One of the best known of these buyers was Marcus Gavius Apicius, a true gourmet. Accompanied by his matron and kitchen steward, he is looking for a rabbit of sufficient quality for one of the new recipes he has just written for his De Re Cocinaria, the first great treatise in the history of cooking. Like all great gourmets, he knows that it is essential to choose good products to make an excellent meal. And this idea is immediately proved right in the kitchen. A kokus, generally a slave who cooks following his master's orders and tastes, begins to prepare the rabbit that Epicius has chosen. The Romans already had invented hobs, but in the patricians' huge villas, the elite of the time, the space reserved for preparing meals was surprisingly restricted. Kitchens in Roman houses did not have the kind of central place that kitchens have today in many houses, but rather there was a place where food was, pre was prepared by the servants and therefore was meant to be done out of view and out of sight and above, out, above all out of odor of uh, any of the members of the house. In fact, uh, the food came to the table, but where it was actually prepared was not considered to be important or interesting in any way. Another characteristic of Roman kitchens was that in order to evacuate wastewater, they were always located close to the latrines, as the toilets were called. In the villas, therefore, convenience did not always mean delicious smells. But this does not prevent the lapinus from being gently glazed with honey to delight this evening's prestigious guest, Seon, the Emperor Tiberius' son. In Rome, sweet grilled meats were always highly appreciated. Another favorite meat dish of the Romans was mincemeat, used to make a variety of stuffings. The Romans were always expert at stuffing snails and masters at stuffing pig's guts with cheap cuts or offal. 
Epicius kitchens, the Lucanica, as they were known, were composed of numerous condiments, delicately mixed with smoked pork or beef. This sausage is popular in Rome or Strasbourg, as Frankfurter sausages are today included pepper, cumin, savory and parsley, mixed with fat and pine nuts. The Romans prepared amazing banquets with their stuffed foods. These feasts inspired great gourmets and also the first novelist, Caius Petronius Arbiter, known as Petronius. On his wax tablets in the Satyricon, the guest of all the great aristocratic households evoked the pleasures and frenzies of meals under the empire. Already drunk, his hand lying on his wife's shoulder, his forehead decorated by several crowns and wet from the scent that ran into his eyes, he sat down in the seat of honor and immediately requested wine. Trimalchion, charmed by his good humor, asked for an even larger cup. The frescoes at Pompeii provide perfect illustration to Petronius' account and the orgiastic behavior of the rich citizens governed by Nero. But Pompeii, frozen forever by the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD, also supplies a considerable amount of further information on Roman behavior. We should not believe that the Romans spent their time eating and having orgies. For the Romans, a meal was also meant to be a sober occasion, because, contrary to legend, they were an abstemious people who ate little. Only the privileged few were able to indulge themselves in magnificent dinners. These dinners were composed of two parts, first a banquet known as the Kenna, and then the commissatio, which prolonged the banquet by a drinking session or a form of orgy, during which the master of the banquet proposed that a certain number of cups of wine be drunk, toasting the health of all present. These sessions could end extremely late at night and sometimes in a state of advanced inebriation. The rich, whether they had overdone their wine intake or not, always ate lying down, leaning on their left elbow, and only eating with the right hand. During meals, poets, often accompanied by their lyre, created an atmosphere of celebration, combining feasting with superstition. At Pompeii, the magnificent villas of the Vitais, the Menanda, or Julia Felix, watched over by the Penates, or domestic gods, are still intact and evoke rites connected with eating. In the homes of the wealthy, the dining room, or triclinium, was considered a symbol representing the world. We need to imagine that the dining room was the universe, with its three main parts. The ceiling, which represented the world of the gods and the heavens. Then the table, which is missing here, and on which the servants placed the dishes, represented the earth. Lastly, there was the world of the dead the floor, onto which remains were thrown for the deceased. In Rome, entertaining was above all about impressing one's guests. Social or political success was measured by the quality and abundance of the dishes.
the everyday life of the Roman pleb was much more frugal. Like the Greek diet, the Roman diet had a very low protein content and was simply enriched by cereals or ingredients from distant lands. Romans ate more or less everything that we eat today, except that in the Roman period, of course, a lot of these things had to come from distant parts of the empire. And in particular, I would like to mention the spices that came from India and even further from the South Sea Islands. And it's interesting to notice that there was a Roman emporium in South India where uh, they collected these foodstuffs that were needed in, at home in Rome. And above all, I think it's also important to underline that they ate just about the same things that we eat today, except that uh, there are myths about their food consumption. In particular, some people think that they ate, did not eat pork. Uh, as it turns out, we know that great amounts of pork were actually consumed, and even that they probably were the first to domesticate porks uh, and make them into an animal that was closer to what we know today. With progress in breeding methods, the Romans were able to eat pork more frequently. Prepared in small quantities as a stew or to make meatballs for ordinary families, it was given much more sophisticated treatment by famous butchers such as Vitalis. His superb dugs, famous pig's trotters or brawn, and a large choice of smoked hams and sausages made him one of Rome's best known butchers. The right of the actual meal, however, was the same for all. The ordinary people who did not have the means for triclinium's and their accompanying furniture ate sitting down. Breakfast, known as yentaculum, was eaten upon awakening and consisted of cheese bread accompanied by honey or olive oil and sometimes a little fruit was added. This had to last a Roman until sunset, and the only real meal was dikena, that is to say, dinner. It was possible, however, to take a short break for lunch, the prandium. The poor took out a chunk of bread and a few olives. Better off citizens were able to offer themselves various hot dishes at the Thermopoleum. This very first fast food system, invented for the Roman citizen, existed on street corners in Rome and Pompeii and offered one or two main dishes which could be taken away or eaten on the spot. In this Thermopoleum in Pompeii, the counter must have contained olives, fruit and hot cereal-based dishes and, very often, some boiled meat. And to a certain extent, uh, boiled food has always been seen as the simpler kind of food. And so, in a way to show that you are more cultivated or you are superior to others, uh, you will indicate people as being eaters of boiled meats, whereas your preparation of these meats is more refined and that you are uh, going to prepare it in ovens or, or fry that meat. And this is possibly the root why uh, the Greeks saw the Romans as uh, consumers of boiled meat because they were basically, or at least they thought, uh, rather uncultured people. But 
The Mash Eaters, as they were nicknamed by the Greeks, were also great travellers. About every 60 kilometres along the immense Roman road network built right across Europe, there were always places to eat something. For example, on the Via Domitia, which linked Rome to Spain. To the west of what is today Nîmes in France, Roman engineers built a colossal bridge with 11 arches across a river that had legendary flood levels and designed mansiones nearby. People on foot or horseback could rest here, look after their mount, have a drink or eat a piece of fresh bread. There was no shortage of bread throughout the empire. It was usually in the form of pancakes, and everyone could eat as much as they wanted. There was no famine in the Roman Empire. Bread was even a significant tool of social policy. In Rome, between 200 and 300,000 penniless people each received two loaves a day. When the empire celebrated a new conquest, the citizens were even allowed to have a double ration of bread and wine to drink to the emperor's health. During the first century BC, the provinces around Rome were the largest exporters of wine in the ancient world. Two centuries later, the empire had practically doubled in size and the situation had been reversed. Rome was no longer an exporter, but had become an importer. Bacchus was less and less a Roman. The entire Mediterranean coast, and in particular the south of Gaul, had been colonized by vines. This led to the development of the art of Gallo-Roman viticulture. Vines were cultivated as plants or on stakes, and one of the best-known vineyards, according to the Latin authors of the period, such as Columella or Pliny, was the Turicula domain. Here, delicious wine potions were matured by the sun from bunches of grapes, visually espousing olive tree branches. According to legend, the fruit of this union gives the potions drinker the vine strength and the olive tree's endurance. The marriage of the grape and the olive therefore pay tribute to Bacchus, the god of wine. With them, vine growing became an art form and at the same time a market in which each color had its place. The wine growers of antiquity rapidly began to specialize, taking customers' tastes into account. The Romans did not like red grape varieties, they only liked white grapes. It appears, though, that the Gauls and the Greeks appreciated red grape varieties. The Gauls practice a custom which the Romans considered unbelievably barbaric, drinking their wine undiluted. Wine was always drunk diluted with water, except in Germany and Gaul. Later, the Gallo-Romans, through what we call Romanization, began imitating their conquerors' customs and adopted consumer habits similar to those of the Romans. Quality control did not yet exist on the great wine-growing properties of antiquity. It was quantity that counted. The Romans did everything they could to press every drop from the grape. After treading it by foot, so as not to lose a drop, the precious nectar was pressed by a weight of over a ton, operated by an ingenious system of pulleys. The juice was then vinified and aromatized by honey, or, on the contrary, slightly salted by seawater. 
The cellar masters, who were experienced enologists, added concentrated grape juice, known as de fruitum, to the wine as it fermented, enabling the wine to remain smooth until the end of fermentation. I've come to the conclusion that the wines which were the most appreciated in Italy were wines which had benefited from noble aging, completely transforming their taste and color. White wines became amber-colored or nearly black, with a taste that recalled the wines of Andalusia, Madeira or the Italian Vincento. They were very unlike French wines. I am convinced that if we were to have given a Roman one of our great Bordeaux wines, he would have found it disgusting. But in Rome, where each citizen drunk an average of 150 litres of wine every year, great vintages such as Falermo could be transformed into undrinkable mixtures, according to Marshall in his epigrams, especially if the amphora came from the unscrupulous merchants of Massilia, today Marseille. Your unfortunate friends receive terrible poisons from you from across the seas for the same price as Falermo. I know why you no longer come to Rome. It is because you must be afraid to drink your wine. Because of the sudden gales in the Mediterranean, many galleys overloaded with counterfeit Falermo never reached port. History does not relate whether poisoned fish floated to the surface at the site of the shipwrecks, the fish having drunk some of this counterfeit Falermo. However, chroniclers all tell of the Romans' keen interest in sea treasures. The sea is the element which costs the most to man's stomach through its preparations, its dishes and its delicacies. This observation by the writer Pliny the Elder may have been made by Lucius Lucullus. We hardly remember that this general, who later became a senator, conquered Asia Minor, but history informs us that he was one of the first great gourmets. And like all Romans, he adored seafood. So as not to be dependent on Neptune's wrath, he even practiced the latest fashion, fish pond breeding. Rich patricians were able to have red mullet, conger, octopus, bonito or turbo, very expensive products in high demand. Ordinary fish cost two to three times more than the best meat. Some fine catches such as moray or bass were even sold at auctions. As a result, the Romans, who were smart and loved their food, developed fish breeding. It would seem from the sources that we have that the Romans were great lovers of fish. And of course, to a certain extent, that was possible because Rome was so close to the sea. Uh, not only that, it had large uh, fleets and uh, therefore it was easy to have a regular supply of fish. But what's interesting is that the Romans also developed fish farms. They were probably some of the first people to do that and managed to therefore cultivate fish in a way that than was further done in the, in the Middle Ages. In Rome, nothing was wasted, everything thrived and was transformed. The Romans did not throw any part of their fish away. Heads and innards, sometimes slightly rotten, were pressed and filtered to make gerum, a sauce made of fish, prized by the ancients. In the early Christian era, this highly salted sauce was a luxury condiment. But the empire's development and the fact that it replaced salt in mostly plain and uninspired cooking of the time made it an indispensable sauce in Roman cuisine. 
To meet demand, which had increased within just a few decades, Geyrum was manufactured in industrial quantities on all the empire's shores. Geyrum received an appellation according to the category of fish it came from. Today, Geyrum is still used a long way from Rome, in Asia, where it is called Nyokmam. The Romans also had a weakness for poultry. As these had to be plump, they were fattened, but not any old how. Frescoes in the Villa Vetae at Pompeii provide a record. Everything that flies is force-fed with one of the Romans' favorite fruits, the fig. The fig was a mythical fruit that came from the tree under which Romulus and Remus, who had founded Rome, were discovered. The writer Pliny describes 25 varieties, including white, violet, green and black. The fig tree harvest was always an important gourmet event for this family of patrician landowners. However, it was a real Tantalus torture for their slaves. There was no question of compromising the goose liver fattened with figs, one of Roman cooking's best known dishes. To the Romans, liver became so closely connected to the fig that ficus gave its name to liver, ficatum. Eaten fresh, dried or with honey, figs were also the favorite ingredients of the sweet and savory harmonies found on all Roman tables. Whether it grow from delicacies or temptations, greed can be a nasty fault, particularly when it becomes an alibi to start a war. In 150 BC, Caton, worried by a sudden revival in Carthage's power, appeared before the senators carrying a basket of fresh figs. When do you think this fruit was picked? It was picked at Carthage only three days ago. That is how close the enemy is to our walls. The metaphor of fresh figs upset the senators so much that they voted the Third Punic War against the Carthaginians. Tartago de Lenda. Carthage must be destroyed, and Caton's wish was fulfilled. Two centuries later, in 98 AD, under the reign of Trajan, the Roman Empire was at its height. 25 legions watched over its frontiers from the north of England to the Sahara and from Portugal to Syria. The Pax Romana reigned everywhere, or nearly. To the north of Bagacum, today Bavay, in the Nord department of France, German tribes were rebelling and centurions marched to the front. To commemorate the Emperor Tiberius' visit here 2,000 years ago, these history enthusiasts meet each year on the site of the ancient Forum of Bagacum to enact the exploits of Roman legionaries.
In civilian life, this Opsio, a non-commissioned officer to Marcus Julius Gallus, is a history teacher at the Lycée in LV. Precise and meticulous with his men, he has reconstituted every single detail of a Roman soldier's kit. In the evening in the bivouac, this equipment becomes proof that Rome did not acquire its invincibility solely by the sword, or pilum, a throwing spear, but also through faultless logistics. We carry between three to ten days' rations of wheat in our kit, and we each eat about 1.4 to 1.5 kilos every day. A legion therefore needed seven tons of wheat. The marching legions were followed by wagons. Rome's strength depended upon its supply columns, which allowed the 5,000 men of a legion to march 30 kilometers every day with 40 kilos kit. This evening in the camp, Marcus Julius knows that his soldiers' morale depends upon their mess tin. They all have their ration of dried vegetables, but the Opsio plays the role of pater familias to improve their everyday fare. And to make the chickpeas taste better, you mix them with as much cumin as you want according to your taste. Or you mix wine vinegar and honey in with your lentils. We love these combinations of sweet and savory. Cooking is in a sense our pastime once we have cleaned our arms. The legionary was somebody who liked to eat well and who needed to eat well to be fit to fight. The dried vegetables, which were light to carry, were responsible for the many triumphs of Roman legions. Lentils, often to be found in the legionary's bag, were also very practical for playing Latronculus, the ancestor of backgammon. The stakes were less high when betting with lentils rather than Cistertius, Roman money. Gladiators, on whom phenomenal amounts were betted, also appreciated lentils. When one carried a nickname that could be chanted by 30,000 spectators in the Roman Colosseum, it was not enough simply to eat to live, it was necessary to eat to win, and ultimately survive. Their interest in dried vegetables was mainly motivated by a strict energy-producing diet. At the School for Gladiators in Nîmes, directed by the then-famous Dr. Sextus Latinus, fighters often came from all over Gaul and even Iberia. They were worth a fortune and therefore needed to be looked after, as much chickpeas, vegetables and cheese as they wanted, depending upon their weight and training program. The gladiator was a sportsman, unlike Hollywood's vision of him. He was not somebody who was there to kill as fast as possible in the arena, but someone who had had a very long training. And like leading contemporary athletes, they were given slow sugars. They didn't eat pasta, they ate cereals, spelt and chickpeas. They were given the basic food of the Roman world, which provided them with strength and energy. As far as their drink was concerned, the diet was strict. No wine, only water, and the water could not be too cold as it would tire them and make them short of breath. In France, in the ditches of the Faculty of Nîmes, modern-day gladiators of the Actor Institute demonstrate that these men, who were sometimes better known than our football players, were above all high-level athletes.
In a sense, they disagree with the research of Austrian scientists, who recently stated that gladiators, too rich and too fat, must have looked like sumo wrestlers. The techniques employed required speed and breath. The retiare and the secuto needed to run well, the secuto in particular, with a helmet on his head. It's difficult to imagine someone who weighed 120 kilos being able to run after retiare for three minutes, the duration of a fight, who wore no armor and could move as fast as possible. Iconographies of the time portray muscular and athletic gladiators, not fat ones. Perfectly regulated fights, true choreographies, rigorous combat and often inevitable death. In the tunnels under the arenas, Rome toppled into macabre superstition. Masked gravediggers retrieved the victim's still warm blood and ran to sell it. Gladiator's blood was deemed as a remedy against epilepsy, it was said and above all, a youth-giving fluid. Another fluid, rich and soft, smooth and preserving, also developed under the sun and interested the Romans, olive oil. Around the perimeter of the Mediterranean basin, the olive tree grew, and it was a cult object. However, it only gave a good harvest every other year. Cultivating it, we pray the olive tree to bear fruit. Pruning it, we restrict it from doing so. So the saying went in antiquity. Many agronomers, such as Columella, gave lengthy accounts of the olive grove's rigorous and methodical farming. It is important not to make a mistake when harvesting to obtain the right balance between the moment when the olive is just ripe, waiting to be picked, and too ripe, with too much acidity. Pressed, crushed, or refined, the olive gives different qualities of oil according to the pressing, the month in which it was harvested, and above all, the place where it grew. During the Roman Empire, they had problems producing enough olive oil in Italy. So we see that large cultivations of olive oil were done in North Africa and then were imported into the, the peninsula. But at, at the same time, I think it's important to point out that, uh, that animal fats were also used. And to a certain extent, the whole idea that Romans were consumers of olive oil, only olive oil, goes back a little bit to this whole development of the idea of a Mediterranean diet that has been somehow mythically pushed back into time and that the Romans would have been the first ones to, to be consuming this uh, Mediterranean style food. Adept of Mediterranean diets, there were, however, some drops of olive oil that the Romans did not use solely for eating. This was the oil that remained at the bottom of the presses. These thick oils, mixed with must, were used only for lighting. And sometimes the assistant cooks, the cocci, when not concentrated, seasoned the vegetables with lamp oil, causing the guests indignation as they had a very sure palate when it came to olive oil. In the kitchen gardens, to mix with the subtle, fruity olive oil flavors, the Romans carefully cultivated a variety of fragrances, mint, coriander, garlic, celery, cumin, or bay leaf, were all marvelous ways to bring out the flavor of minced meats. Epicius will not contradict this, particularly when he is about to receive Tiberius' son, Drusus, at his table. Although he loved sumptuous meals, he also cultivated a great many vegetables. 
Cucumbers, asparagus, mushrooms, leeks, carrots or artichokes were the vegetables most often found in Epicurus' very inventive recipes. A true connoisseur of their nutritional and healing virtues, he liked quoting extracts from Pliny's Natural History. Salad is salutary against gout, sparkling eyes and dislocations. This evening in Epicurus kitchens, a large quantity of cabbage is also being cooked and the tender shoots under the axilla of the leaves in fact resembles today's broccoli. Once cooked, they will be ideal for accompanying stuffed snails. To season rabbit and pork ribs, he has had spices sent from the empire's eastern limits. Epicurus adored pepper and cloves. But right now, he must find rose petals. The first great gourmet in history could have thrown himself into preparing sow's dugs stuffed with sea urchins or pink flamingos' tongues with honey. However, his endless inspiration led him to prepare nightingales baked with rose petals. Choosing rose petals was an art. Epicius had an excellent nightingale supplier, but a few quails or thrushes would do. His recipe went. Two birds per person are needed. Place the rose petals on the water surface. The cocky have already chopped up their offal and Epicius personally watches over the preparation of the stuffing, an essential part of a Roman recipe. Once the noble birds have been delicately smeared with honey, cut the mint carefully. Then, with a generous dose of olive oil, grind pepper, coriander, garlic and cloves with aromatic herbs, accompanied by a drop of de fruitum, concentrated grape juice. After preparing this sauce, Epicurus orders that each bird be delicately stuffed with a pick of the crop prune. After 30 minutes cooking on a low flame, the rose petals are added just before serving. Complete happiness is ensured with an amphora from Falermo. Epicurus impressed Seyan and Drusus, Tiberius' sons. All Rome spoke with wonder of this new dish. Epicurus was unbelievably fashionable and inscribed the recipe on the tablets of the Patrician School of Cooking, which he had just opened in the Empire's capital. There he taught the secrets of preparing a dish of camel's feet, crayfish stuffed with caviar, or other dishes that became hallmarks of ancient Roman cuisine. Certainly, Apicius is an important source for Roman cuisine. There are certain elements that would seem to be typical of the late Roman imperial period, and in particular, the sweet and sour combination, which is very much of a hallmark that then seems to disappear in, in Europe for quite a long time in the Middle Ages. And so in that sense, probably we can consider Apicius as a fairly faithful uh, source for what uh, imperial cuisine was like. It was unthinkable that this mythical gourmet should meet with an ordinary end. Epicurus fell into depression. In 37 AD, he considered that he was no longer able to continually create and innovate. Martial chronicled this over-ambitious and demanding individual's life. Epicurus wrote Martial, 
You still had about 10 million secrets up your sleeve. However, not being content with this situation, you swallowed the ultimate potion, a cup of poison. Never, Epicurus, will you be more greedy. Epicurus feared that he would not be able to maintain his level of excellence, but he surely did not imagine that his name would cross the centuries. Today, Epicurus has found a new disciple in the person of Juan Mari Alzac, who has a three-star restaurant at San Sebastián in Spain, one of Europe's most sought-after tables. The marvelous essence of Basque cuisine and breathtaking inspirations are born in this taste laboratory. Improvising a cortado lamb with a thin veil of coffee, Arzac's avant-garde cuisine is mixed with recipes of the famous gourmet of antiquity. I'm 62 years old. I studied, read and observed everything I could in both the modern and ancient worlds. I look at everything, and I found some very important things in ancient Roman cooking. What has struck me in Epicurus cooking is the balance between sweet and savory. I realized that sweetness stabilizes taste. Therefore, when one adds a little sugar to food, the taste is enhanced and lasts longer. I was struck by this and began researching in this direction. Like Epicurus, Arzac continually seeks perfection. These lemon tree leaves come from Tasmania, this black sesame from Cephalonia, Western Greece. In his taste cabinet, the spices from around the world become the counterpoint of a breathtaking culinary symphony. The dish you're discovering today is roast lamb. It's pretty complicated to prepare. The presentation is also magnificent, and you can eat every bit of it. In Epicurus' time, there was a lot of useless decoration. Today, with our elaborate and numerous techniques, we know that any decoration in cooking must also be delicious to eat. Cook, alchemist and decorator, Arzac displays and distorts flavors. The veil of coffee disappears like a mirage when the dish is served, an ultimate reference to the master of the ephemeral and sumptuous meals of antiquity. Of course, it's now become necessary to look for ingredients from all over the world, but it is true that in cooking, I feel related to a Picius period. Rome's culinary refinement was shattered by the barbarian invasions of the late 5th century, and only a few recipes were saved, thanks to dedicated monks. It was necessary to wait eight centuries for cooking to once again prove its worth, with a taste for mixtures and the memory of Epicurus. This great forerunner of master chefs had understood that greed is not only a sin, but can also be a form of civilization.